Well, it's a real pleasure to be here. I'm very much looking forward to the, the, the conversations. Um, actually, this is going to look really different, but I think it's got a lot of similarities with what um, uh, Charles just said. So I'm going to talk about um, this work that we've been doing on um, decision making under deep uncertainty. Um, so just to you know, tee it up, there are a lot of um, public policy questions where um, having quantitative information is useful, um, but there's a lot of uncertainty. I basically chose a set of things that I work on. There's certainly lots of others. Um, and one of the things that makes it difficult is this, um, what we call deep uncertainty. And this is actually, um, I first heard the term um, from Ken Arrow at a meeting many years ago. So um, that's uh, the odd. But um, this is actually an interesting case, I think, in the, in the light of what, what Charles says. There's a lot of pictures I often show with deep uncertainty. But uh, thinking about um, climate change and, and decarbonization, um, this is just a couple of street scenes. Um, New York, uh, 1910, LA, 1960, um, LA, 2010. Um, and so if you were, a uh, say, a power systems or a transportation engineer, many of the sectors that we need to decarbonize if we want to deal with climate change in a serious way over the next 50 years, and you uh, uh, went to sleep in 1960 and woke up in 2010, um, you know, a lot of things would be different, but you kind of basically figure out, you know, what they were, cars, internal combustion cars, big power, central power plants that's an electrons down wires, and uh, jet planes flying around with lots of people in them, a lot more these days than then. Um, if you uh, were a, a transportation or power engineer in 1910 and woke up in 1960, um, everything would be entirely different. Um, you know, just total transformation. Um, if you look at what all our big energy economic models do that we try to uh, adjudicate climate change policy, they basically all assume change over the last 50 years as opposed to what happened at the beginning of the century. And clearly what we, you know, so what changes will the next 50 years bring? And in fact, if they're kind of like the last 50 years and we're in bad shape, if they're more like the 50 years before it and in the proper way, that would be much more fortunate for us. And this is an identification problem, I think, which James March called uh, your reasoning from samples of one or fewer. Since <laughs> we've, we've, uh, we've only had one case where a world with 19th century technology switched to 20th century technology with about a billion people, and we'll only have one case of a world doing it, whatever it's going to do over the first half of this century with 9 billion people. And it, it's. Everything's a counterfactual because we only get to do it once. So um, deep uncertainty is, exists when parties to decision do not know or agree on the likelihood of alternative futures and how their actions related to consequences, which I think is pretty consistent with the sorts of things Charles was talking about. OK, so um, there's this term wicked problem, which has this uh, deep uncertainty, large to existential scientific uncertainties, um, has complicated uh, dynamics, and then also lays that on groups of heterogeneous people who believe different things and think about the world in different ways. Ways. Um, and how do we deal with those sorts of problems? Um, it's nice to lay out this dichotomy. I like dichotomies. Uh, but on the left is basically the Kahneman and Tversky uh, uh, you know, set of deep insights and what we know about individual decision making. People are overconfident, take actions that's consistent with their interests, acknowledge, avoid trade offs, um, use heuristics, which work great in many situations, but often not in the one they're in. Um, and the lesson from that is that you probably need decision support tools to help people make better decisions. But on the other side, um, uh, uh, pull this from a variety of places, but, but I very much like the work of Martia Sen on, on, on social choice-based moral reasoning, that as, as its fundamental characteristics, our world is filled with people who believe, have different worldviews, believe different things, want different things, and that we have irreducible uh, uncertainty into the consequences of our actions, which are sort of fundamental attributes of the world. This may be a little different than some of your medical decisions where most people think you know, your patient being well is better than not. Um, so that's less trade-offs. And on um, those cases, um, if we design tools that just deal with the problems on the left, sometimes they can prove problematic and mess up. And particularly with the box in the middle, which is essentially um, uh, a variety of, uh, you know, fried people do this, but I very much, you know, focus on the work of Dan Cahan and the Cultural Cognition Group, that our society is uh, often has groups of people who filter what they believe and what they think about the world through their social networks and through consistency with their values. And so that's another overlay on, on 
decision making under uncertainty. OK, so um, we're supposed to talk about normative approaches. My work is very actually sort of practical and how it works. So I'm going to define normative, push on a little bit this way, is that the normative thing you do for these wicked problems is get people to talk to each other in structured, uh, appropriate ways so that they make good social choices. Um, so I list some categories of there having to do with uh, recognizing the uncertainty, recognizing that people d agree on different things, paying attention to each other's views, and using the best available scientific information. And in that sort of world, the role of people like us is to provide decision support, which is to usefully insert this information decision processes so that people can make decisions which are reasonable. Um, and then so the question is, how do we do that? Um, one process that um, we use and find pretty powerful is this idea of deliberation with analysis, where this is often done in, um, um, in, in controlled groups. But people deliberate, basically do their problem framing. You organize the analytics around the problem framing, reinserted into the deliberative group. They may reframe what they're doing, may, may think differently about their objectives, their goals. Um, uh, what they think about how the world works, and you iterate. And this is often most useful in a world where people's goals are, in fact, not stable, that they will evolve as they interact with other people. Oh, by the way, also, uh, we'll use what we call the economist rules. And if you want to ask questions, please, please do dive in. Um, and what I want to argue in this uh, talk and lay out for you, and then some questions, and I'll go through this complicated spaghetti uh, in, in pieces we go through, is in fact we have very quite well-developed and powerful sets of analytic tools that you can insert in these processes. So I'm going to go through that for you. And then I want to open up a bunch of questions at the end of just things we're beginning to think about is, how do we think about appropriately using these tools in processes of social choice, in, in deliberative processes? Because we know, at least I know less about that. OK, so I'm going to describe this robust decision-making approach. And there's actually a, um, you know, a whole set of approaches which are basically the same flavor, so but I'm going to talk about ours. Um, we actually have a society for decision making under deep uncertainty. We just spun up deepuncertainty.org, which is a collection of Yakov's a member and, and people who do work like this. So you take a look at that. I'm going to describe it. I'm going to do one example to give you a concrete um, um, uh, example of how this works, uh, lay out two of the conceptual pieces, and then dive into how do we think about using these things. OK, so the, the, the Dichotomy on, on how to set up the analytics is many of our you know, standard axiomatic risk tools work this way, um, that you say, what do we understand about future conditions? Um, and in the, um, you know, the um, well-characterized risk, we have a joint probability distribution over uh, states of the world. But uh, people stretch this and try to think about you know, how do we characterize future conditions? We use that to rank different decision options, and then we may do some sensitivity analysis. And then I always say, you know, particularly in the standard risk frame, you would never get on an airplane where people who built it and flew it didn't operate very well in that regime. And one of the things they do to make that work is you don't fly the airplane if you don't think you understand how it's going to work, because it's getting into a situation where you, you know, uh, it, if it goes into a regime where you don't understand how it's going to work, you don't do it, which is different than the uh, decarbonization problem I showed you, which it's unavoidable that we have to deal with that uncertainty. Um, but if you take a problem that's organized like this and apply it um, uh, in, in, in a situation of deep uncertainty, various things can go wrong. There's lots of pressure to underestimate the uncertainties. Um, people can strategically use the uncertainty to break down the process. I say competing analysis contribute to gridlock. And uh, if you don't like, many policies are predicated on forecasts. If you don't like the policy, you can attack the forecast because the forecast is more likely to have uh, to be wrong than the, uh, the policy is to have no favorable attributes. So you see that all the time in, in many, many areas. And then this notion that we often know a lot about a problem um, that is not predictive but can help us uh, avoid, help us rank strategies. Um, so to deal with that, um, it's often useful to turn the analysis around and use your analytics essentially running it backwards, where you start with strategies or strategies, and we can talk where those come from. And then you use your analytics to answer essentially high confidence questions in worlds of lots of uncertainty, which is where does this strategy meet or miss its goals? Or where is strategy A better than strategy B? 
And once you begin to understand those sorts of questions, you can think about potential hedging options, and you can think what those alternative hedging options apply about trade-offs. And then you can compare it to the information you actually have. So this is a comparison between agree on assumptions and agree on decisions approaches. Um, so let me give you an example of how this works and what a robust strategy is. That's what is meant to come out of this process. So proposed initial strategies. And I'm going to uh, show you this graph, which comes out of an exact actual example. And I'll show you without labels on it to say what it is at the end. But here are um, three different strategies for this particular problem, um, uh, strategy A, B, and C. And this is a fairly complicated problem, and there's dozens of different uncertainties and a whole bunch of people arguing about what's important about it. But if you take each one of these and ask when is a, what makes A better than B or B better than C, it turns out pretty much all the uncertainties are much less important than one. And one particular uncertainty is the ratio of the inputs to C and B. This is an energy example. These have to do with two different energy production um, technologies. And so it turns out that if we plot these strategies according to this uncertainty and this uncertainty alone, okay, and use a regret measure, so zero is small here, that you get this pattern that if this ratio of uh, C to B is uh, small, A is best. And if it's big, B is best, C is never very good compared to the others. Okay? And once you know that and get people to focus on that, it turns out you can craft a fourth option that looks like that, which interestingly combines B and C and not B and A. And these are time phase, it's an it's a act, monitor, then learn. And that green strategy, this new strategy, has the property of being robust in that it may never be optimal, but it is often much better than the others in that it has, has small regret. Um, and so what this is, is this was an analysis that Rand did um, for um, uh, the, the government of Israel having to do with how to um, it ought to exploit the natural gas deposits found off the Mediterranean coast. Um, there was a huge number, I mean, it was a very, very controversial decision. Um, and um, this did actually a reasonable, this, the, this picture got in and amongst the cabinet actually and allowed them to kind of focus in on a choice of strategy even though there was a lot of disagreement. And actually, this actually happened before the Arab Spring, and it turns out that that answer is robust even to disruption of gas supplies from, from neighbors and things like that. So um, this, this is both a, you know, a, a normatively good strategy and it also um, is useful and it helps people agree uh, when they are arguing about a, a, a when, the, when, when they disagree about a lot of assumptions. Um, and just, I mean, uh, Charles said this better than, than I'm going to hear, but just there's a whole bunch of decision criteria one can use relative, um, relevant to robustness. This one actually, what I showed here, the way we're thinking about it, listen, haven't gone through the exercise of, of where it is different or the same as all the others, but this is a domain criteria based using regret as its measure. Uh, so it's where is regret smallest which strategy has the smallest regret over the widest range of the, the parameter variation? But I think a minimax would probably give something similar to that as well. OK, so that's, so in this, the way we use these analytics has essentially four concepts. It, it, it's a decision analytic approach. Um, and there's going to be a lot of talk about decision analysis here, so I won't say much about that. It, it also brings in scenario ideas. And scenario ideas in the sense of explicitly acknowledging multiple world, world views, both as a way to characterize uncertainty and as a way to draw people who believe in different world views into the analysis. And scenarios are often laid out as, as plausibility, not probability, both as a reflection of what you think about under, uncertainty, but both as a way of allowing people who believe in different probability distributions to join the conversation. And they're often organized in deliberative processes. The third idea is red teaming assumption-based planning, which is that you begin with the plan and then you stress test it to understand 
under what condition, what are the assumptions that are most important to that plan being a reasonable thing to do, and when does the plan break? So you can understand um, where your vulnerabilities are. And then this idea of exploratory modeling, which I'll just say a little bit more on a, another slide, which is using uh, simulation models in a different way. And to say, and the basic idea here is that the standard way that we often think about using simulation models for climate change, energy, all these others, is that they're consolidative. This is uh, words from my colleague Steve Bankus a number of years ago. But consolidative in that they're a way that we package together all the information we have and we envision the model as being a representation of the real world, okay, that we can use in that way, again, so as for an airplane or something like that. Um, it supports deductive reasoning. We can also think of an, models as used in a different way as exploratory in that they map assumptions onto consequences and they don't privilege one, necessarily privilege one set of assumptions over another. So they're basically a way to map a set of assumptions onto a set of consequences constrained by things that we do know and then searching over things that we don't. And as I'm going to argue, it turns out that using models in that way, in that exploratory way, can actually give you a lot of information. And that is a thing that we can, when a lot of the decision analytics that is often used were, 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 were formulated, um, you couldn't really use exploratory models in any serious way because it was just, you didn't have the capability to do it. But now with ubiquitous, ubiquitous computation, fast machines, interactive visualizations, uh, a lot of um, uh, data analytics, um, one can actually use exploratory models in a serious and um, very useful way. Okay, so we pull these four concepts together into this uh, robust decision-making process. I've got a little wheel here, which essentially decision framing, what are people, what are your objectives, what are your ways to get there, um, what are the uncertainties that are most important, how do you think about actions related to consequence, um, you can then take your strategies, evaluate how they do in many, many futures. So stress test them in many futures. You can then take that big data set and, do a, and reduce the information into an understanding of the vulnerabilities, strengths, and weaknesses of different strategies. Uh, from there, you can think of new strategies and or do your trade-off analysis. The outputs of this are two pieces, scenarios that illuminate the vulnerabilities, proposed strategies, and then some agreement on what strategies are robust. And the key idea is that you're starting with strategies, that's the framing, you're using analytics to basically stress test those strategies, where and what kind of futures they work, where do they not, and then using that to help people construct strategies that may be robust and identify and, and uh, adjudicating the trade-offs. And the point, the goal, is to be able to help groups with diverse interests, values, and worldviews manage complex systems, and help people agree on actions even if they don't agree on assumptions. So um, that's the point. Let me give you an example of how this works in a recent case we did. So um, City of Los Angeles is trying to meet uh, federal and state water quality goals. They are in the point of the planning where they've done this regulatory analysis. They've submitted uh, what they're called TMDL, the, the uh, total maximum daily load um, uh, plans for meeting water quality targets. But as is often with these things, they don't really include climate change in any significant way, which, and the question is, you know, what impact does climate change have on these plans? And so this is some work we did for the city of Los Angeles on this topic. Um, that's the San Fernando Valley where we're looking. Um, so um, the city has a plan. Uh, which a consultant produced for them by running these uh, regular regulatory uh, assurance analysis on this uh, on, on the LA River, and the plan is that there, where the percentages have to do with this is the amount of pollutant that you take out uh, annually, and it consists of a portfolio of regional projects, which are basically big spreading basins, green streets, which are essentially bioswales and stuff like that that capture the runoff, and low impact development. Uh, which is um, the same sort of thing, but applied to both um, uh, city-owned and uh, privately-owned property, basically keeping all the runoff on, um, uh, on the property. So there's a, an example of some green infrastructure. Okay, so 
the question we ask is under what condition does the plan meet and miss its water quality goals? So we, this, is our, um, this is our problem framing. Uh, we focus on two uncertainty, those in land use and those in climate change. Uh, the objective is to meet the uh, zinc uh, TMDL, which is the uh, sort of rate limiting pollutant. And we just took the models that had been used by the consultant doing the regulatory analysis and use that for the stress test. And so we run the model over a wide range of different climate futures and a wide range of different assumptions about land use. You get a whole range of different outcomes. This is zinc loading um, and just uh, distribution of cases. That's the regulatory target. And so the question is, under what conditions do you miss the regulatory target? In a process um, called scenario discovery, which I'll talk a little about more in a second, the answer is this picture right here. So it turns out of all the uncertainties that uh, in this system, if you plot all the cases we ran as a function of the intensity of the 24 hour rainfall event and the impervious area of the city, um, that and draw a line like that, um, it does the best. Each one of those little dots, the blue and the red dots is one run of the model. There's several hundred runs here. Uh, each run is a particular land use future and a particular climate future. That and blue means you hit the regulatory target, red means you missed it. And so basically that line separates the scenario where you miss the goal and you meet the goal. And that's the, the cleanest separation between those two and any two variables you can consider. Okay? And the green X is um, the, uh, the planning case. So not surprisingly, the plan meets its goals in um, if the future turns out as expected, um, it turns out to be sig fairly significant. Uh, you know, uh, uh, you're fairly close to the boundary. Uh, if climate change makes the 24-hour uh, storm more intense, you're a lot further. If the um, if the land use is turns out to be a lot, the, the impervious area goes up, and it turns out that the the line second from the bottom is the city's um, very aggressive. Uh, the stormwater ordinance, which was developed simultaneously to the water quality plan, but wasn't included in it. So, um, but also is fairly uncertain. Okay, so um, what can you do with this plot? Well, the first thing you can think about is how would I hedge against the fact that there's an awful lot of cases here where I miss the regulatory target? So, look, one thing that this tells you is that if you meet, if you actually implement the stormwater master plan and change the impervious area of the city, which is basically a lot less concrete on, in LA and a lot more stormwater goes in the aquifers, you're down to the bottom of the chart and you pretty much bought out the climate uncertainty. So, one thing you might do is here's the new options is you might begin with the current plan, meaning the current investments in um, the various uh, uh, pollution capture controls, and monitor. And if this, you notice the city fails to achieve the mandated land use, and the climate scientists can't tell us something with high confidence about the um, incident of the 24-hour rainfall event, um, and if, if either of those things happen, you would switch to a new plan, and we can calculate what you would need to implement that new plan. And if you are on that, of that, you would just stay with the, with the current plan. Okay? And you might actually then say also, well, if I know I'm going to switch, it's two things. One, it tells you what you need to monitor, and there's some very interesting things, both with remote sensing and looking at the um, uh, you know, direct observations that you could put together to know whether you were on the plan to um, uh, meet this, um, the, the land use, um, uh, the impervious thing. And you know what you would have to do if you don't. And so you could, say, put some options on some of the land you might need to set aside for your um, uh, regional projects and so forth. So you can construct this as a fairly detailed plan. Um, and should you do it, well, first off, uh, well, two things. One is now we can take what information we do have on the likelihood of these different climates. And so this we used as essentially a range of probability distribution. Uh, there are some very, um, uh, this is Alex Hall's work, but some very um, uh, uh, specific probability estimates for the different climate futures in Los Angeles. And that's that, that line right there. You can also take as another limit the equal weighting 
um, across all the futures, assuming an equal weighting over the IPCC full ensemble. Uh, you basically get the same answer in both cases that um, uh, there's a significant um, uh, chance of me missing your goals if, uh, if, if you don't have this, um, uh, this you know, the, the land use, if, if the, the land use doesn't turn out the way that the city plan suggests. So um, you can use this information, though, to decide whether you want to do one, where, uh, an adaptive plan where you start with the current plan or where, for instance, you might want to uh, start with a more augmented plan. So, okay, so that, this then gives the city enough information so they can think through, you know, which, which way they want to, to, to do their bets. All right. Um, this just is that there's this sort of thing has been done in a, in a lot of different places by us, by us and other groups. Um, and it turns out to be a pretty powerful way for planning agencies to use their models um, in these conditions and in deep uncertainty and tell the story to themselves and to their uh, ratepayers uh, and others why they're doing what they're doing. Okay, so let me just focus a little bit more on these two sets of tools. Um, uh, two key steps in these processes. One is, um, first off, there's, there's a lot of machinery that allows us to do this in a pretty um, uh, uh, you know, straightforward way now. One is high-speed computation, either you know, high-speed computers or Amazon Web Services is, uh, is, is a pretty powerful way to do it. Uh, lots of visualization tools, robust optimization, the sufficiently powerful so you can do it on these complicated problems, and then this uh, scenario discovery idea. So let, I'm going to talk through the scenario discovery and the robust optimization. So let me give you a little bit more on this. So how did we get that plot we showed you on the, um, um, for the uh, LA uh, water quality one? So we had a plan. We have a whole bunch of futures. This gives us a big database, big multi-dimensional database. And you can run then um, essentially categorization algorithms. You could use um, CART. We use one called PRIM, uh, patient rule induction method. There's a whole variety of these tools you can use. But basically ask the question, I would like to draw a low dimensional picture which has, um, you know, does the best job of differentiating the futures where the plan meets and misses the goals. And I'd like that picture to be interpretable in the sense that people can understand what the axes mean. And you can put algorithms that do that for you, find that, and essentially project these multi-dimensional data sets down into low-dimensional interpretable uh, pictures. And you can measure whether people are actually understanding what these pictures mean. It turns out that if, if, with certain constraints, if you do it the right way, people actually understand what these pictures mean. Um, let me give you another example where this worked really well. This is a, a, a project we did about 10 years ago on the um, US um, terrorism reinsurance program, and which was put in place right after 9-11 uh, and then up for reauthorization uh, twice. This was the first reauthorization. So it turned out right after 9-11, um, all the commercial property insurers in the U.S. realized that they were insuring people like the owners of the World Trade Center against catastrophic terrorist attacks, which they hadn't really realized were in their contracts. So they dropped all the coverage. And so Congress quickly passed a law which essentially gave free reinsurance over, uh, with rules that basically said there's a gigantic deductible um, to the property insurers. And uh, you know, in the case of big terrorist attacks, so they, most of them reassure, came back with the insurance. And then the question was, uh, a couple of years later, should this policy stay in effect? And as these things go, I mean, it was, it was, there was a lot of uncertainties, but it was also mixed with a lot of different views on the role of government and uh, the free market and that sort of thing. So we did one of these analyses, and it was a multi-objective uh, analysis. I'm just focusing on one important objective here, which is, does this program save or cost the taxpayer money? Okay, and which is an important question because actually there's an official score that goes through the congressional budget process that says whether it 
saves the cost. And so it turns out this is, of course, a complicated question because it depends on what you think the tariffs are going to do. It depends what you think that the insurance companies are going to do. And it depends what you think the uh, Congress is going to do. And so it, it, was, it was not hard for people to be all over this particular debate. And not surprisingly, where they were in the debate correlated really strongly with what they wanted the answer to be. So we did one of these uh, endeavors. And, um, we had an economic model, a bunch of data with some expert elicitation on what the tariffs were going to do, and, um, and some models for what, what Congress may do. And you run it, and you do the scenario discovery on it. You project it down. You get this actually very simple picture for whether this program saves or costs the tariffs, uh, the, the taxpayer money. And so there's two axes here. One is the probability of a large attack. And this turns out to be the number here having to do with the way the law is constructed is $40 billion in damages, which is two World Trade Center attacks. And so a one means that this um, subjective Bayesian probability, which is generated by the um, reinsurance industry great, and the, um, uh, uh, the intelligence community, they, every six months they come out with the subjective probability. So one means they got it right. 10 means that uh, the actual probability is 10 times bigger than they say, 100 times bigger, and then a tenth bigger. The vertical axis is the, um, uh, how much Congress compensates uh, uninsured property owners after a big terrorist attack. And the gray area is where the, uh, this program saves the taxpayer money, and the white area is where it costs the taxpayer money. And once you see the chart, the, the mechanism is, 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 is fairly clear why it's going on. It has to do with how much of an, a small attack is insured by the, uh, by the insurance companies versus since the insurance rates go up with the program in place. But the interesting things here are, first off, the uh, official scores by the Congressional Budget Office and the Treasury said it would cost taxpayer money. And that's because they took the subjective probability and they assume no compensation by Congress, because that's the rules that they need to operate under. And you look at this, and you don't need to make any statement about what you think the probability are or what you think Congress is going to do, but it's, it's clear that that's somewhat of an anomalous case. So this particular way of organizing the information proved pretty powerful in this debate. Um, one of the proponents of the bill cited it on the Senate floor. Uh, the people who didn't like it, um, Wall Street Journal in particular, um, called the analysis insidious because they couldn't argue about the choice of scenario because you can show mathematically that this is the best picture to show this, that that line is the very best with, the, uh, with all the assumptions, all the uncertainties that separate where the, the assumptions where the taxpayer saves or costs money. So, this scenario is consistent with the government forecast, but gives, suggests how you would get an, uh, another answer, and in fact, why you might believe that you would get a different answer. Mixes uncertainty regarding states of the world with uncertainty regarding um, probability. So it's got a, you know, a probability uncertainty and a state of the world uncertainty. And interestingly, mixes external and internal drivers, because this one has to do with what the terrorists do, and this one has to do with Congress, the decision maker itself does, the organization itself that you're briefing, which is, and it turns out when you do this sort of scenario analysis um, quantitatively, it's often this sort of mix between internal and external factors that prove important. OK. Um, this just says that these are imprecise. These are sets of probabilities. Charles covered that pretty well. Um, let me just say a little bit about robust optimization. Um, this is a Colorado ex uh, River example. This is, I won't go into this in much detail, but Colorado River you know, serves a huge number of people, a lot of US agriculture. Uh, the supply and the demand, uh, it, it, it's becoming significantly stressed, both because of climate change and rising demand. There was a big analysis a couple of years ago that we participated in. Um, the, uh, we came in when the parties to the Colorado Compact, seven states in the US government, had come up with about 1,000 different climate projections that they were using, uh, climate model projections, historical projections, paleo climate, which is a 1,000-year record, and then different combinations of the models and the paleo climate, because the models don't get the depth of the, um, the droughts that have actually occurred over the last 1,000 years. And this is a very smart group. And each group had reasons to believe the projections that gave them the answer they wanted. 
So we went in and essentially did this idea of running each of the projections against different demand projections and different, be, uh, different assumptions about how the process would operate at crisis if the river um, went into various crisis modes. Um, and went through the exercise, this, gives, this gave some huge number of cases, 24,000 different futures. And you can just run the optimization for each one on this big uh, river model. And then this is a summary of what you get out of that. So there's hundreds of different options. You look at the, the optimum for each, each path. And it turns out that they fall into several different categories, which are some options. And these will have to do with you know, different uh, think conservation, different um, infrastructure investments, that sort of thing. Some things you always implement, no matter what future you get. Some things you rarely implement. And some things you sometimes do and sometimes don't. And you can articulate this a little bit uh, more precisely in this sort of this sort of thing. And this is a, a, a summary of a whole bunch of these different options. But there are some options where the, the boxes, the percentages here are how many of the different cases that um, they're, uh, um, they're implemented in and um, uh, divided by basically all futures and one of these um, vulnerable scenarios. And the size of the box is when they're implemented. A big box means soon, and a small box means uh, a decade or two from now. And so there are some which are basically always used and soon. So those are things on the to-do list. There are some things which are sometimes used, but sometimes not, but never come in early. So they can, we can all agree that we put those on the hold list. And then there's a much smaller subset of things that we may or may not use, but if we do, we use them now. So we've taken this complicated problem and essentially parsed it down. We understand the vulnerabilities in a way that's high confidence. We understand where the plans break, where they don't. And then we understand we can uh, categorize hundreds of different options into the things that we don't do, things that we do now, things we can wait on, and then a smaller number of things that we uh, can essentially negotiate over. Um, that is a fairly crude way to go through um, the um, essentially turning these uh, coming up with options over uncertainties. There's some much more powerful tools, which we've been, um, uh, colleagues and I and our team have been developing, where you essentially do the full uh, Pareto, uh, multi-objective Pareto surfaces, but do it under conditions of deep uncertainty. This is an example for a Texas water utility. Um, and these are fairly complicated. I haven't figured out how to make these simple yet. But these, uh, over a couple of different um, objectives, having to do with cost, reliability, um, complexity of the um, uh, implementation complexity. You get various uh, Pareto surfaces. And it turns out that the, and then you can stress test these over a wide range of uncertainty about drought frequency and that sort of thing. And it turns out that the blue ones, though that they're a little bit less good on a couple of uh, options, um, are much more stable over a wide range of uncertainties. And so these are essentially robust Pareto surfaces because they are the solutions stay close to the surface over a wide range of scenario uncertainty. OK. And so this is this deliberation with analysis process. There's some pretty powerful tools for doing the analytics and giving vulnerability analyses and options analyses into the deliberative processes. Exactly how to use that is a little bit more ad hoc um, and I think is an area which is um, I, I find very interesting and would, would, would love to, to chat with people about. Um, I think the, uh, the Amartya Sen framing I find really interesting where, um, as previously, he points out that ethical reasoning should recommend this diversity of goals and irreducible uncertainty is fundamental. That he very much he he differentiates between what he calls transcendental and relational reasoning. Transcendental reasoning is what we know the best end state we can all agree on, and then having understood the best end state we can agree on, we plot a path towards it. He very much says that in. For most real world problems, the best we're going to do is going to be able to come up with essentially partial orderings of near term steps and iterate our way through the problem because we can't agree on what the end state is going to look like in sufficient detail. 
oh, nor know how to get that, um, these approaches, and what does this process, iterative process of social choice look like? You need to be basically open, iterative, uh, clearly explicate what you're doing, which we think this analytics supplies. Um, you can do some lab experiments um, to see, as imperfect as they are, to see, to learn things about how to use these tools. This um, is one we recently did, um, which basically gives people a decision support tool, um, whatever they're supposed to manage a fishery. And the, what's different about here than some of these uh, uh, lab decision experiments is that it, it, there's a really vast decision space. And the whole challenge of the experiment is to use the decision support tool to navigate through a very vast set of options where there's only a very small fraction that are meet multiple objectives and are robust across multiple scenarios. And we did a probabilistic framing, a, a scenario framing, and you do get some evidence that the scenario framing allowed people to be more exploratory and work their way through in a systematic way through this vast set of options, which was in the decision tool was basically five different pull down menus where you put together different combinations of adaptive decisions um, and came up with uh, more, robust, more and more robust strategies with one type of decision tool, a scenario based decision tool as opposed to a forecast based one. Um, one thing that I've, we've been starting to work on, which I think is really interesting, is connecting this with um, essentially the cultural theory of risk and um, um, different working with anthropologists to understand the worldviews and the groups we're working with, essentially do the multi-objective, multi-scenario analysis for each worldview separately, um, and then understand where these multi-objective, multi-scenario Pareto surfaces intersect or are close to one another as a way of trying to understand the essentially negotiation space for, um, for different complicated problems and allow the different groups to engage in joint problem solving on solutions that might bring them closer together. And we've been uh, essentially using this, uh, starting with a the cultural theory framework, but there's other anthropological frameworks you can use, but we call it plural rationalities in RDM. And then just, I mean, areas which I think are interesting is the cultural theory one, um, again, the social choice is a way of thinking about organizing the way you put these analytics into decision processes. Um, the political science aspect is, is clearly key here, though I sort of understand that least. I mean, there's some work in thinking about how you set up political processes to follow a pragmatist style uh, learning process, which, which clearly I think these tools can, can contribute to. But um, um, I. This is, these are areas where I, I think I know how to tee up questions, but not sure of any of the answers. And then the big question, of course, is you know, can you use these sorts of tools to um, get public discussions to work better? And we start to play a little bit with how you take some of these tools, particularly the scenario discovery one. Um, but the, 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 that whole Colorado analysis is up on the RAND website where people can play with it and do their own sort of a vulnerability analysis and options analysis. So can you use these to, to shape, shape political discussions? And um, websites or society, and hope I have some time for questions. Hi, uh, Richard Bradley from the LSE. So. Yeah. So one thing I always find very difficult is sort of trying to, I mean, yeah. so, so because you're, the, the approach that you use is sort of very different, I think, in some yeah. ways from the way that the sort of economist-y yeah. type decision theorists think about it. So it's very difficult to sort of match the two together and understand yeah. if there is disagreement and where that yeah. disagreement is. So one thing that seems, I mean, just I'm asking you to sort of correct yeah. me here, that seems sort of notable about the way is that uh, it's a sort of a satisfying rather than an optimizing yeah. approach yeah. In that yeah. you sort of set you set sort of levels of achievement that mm -hmm. are critical, and then you don't worry too much about whether, I mean, you're not looking at the extent to which particular actions exceed that critical level. Really, mm -hmm. you're just sort of focusing on how, how often, as it were, in, in possibility space, yeah. you're getting over that critical level. Is, is that a sort of fair description? Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's definitely not optimization, because if you, um, yeah, I mean, if, if you were in a, if you, I mean, this is a lot of work, and so if you could, if you could optimize, you should. And so this is problems for, for whatever set of reason, there's not an optimum. Um, um, we, 
it's off. I mean, it, the decision rule is often part of the deliberation. Um, so satisficing is often a useful thing to do. I mean, for all the reasons that Herbert Simon laid out. Um, but I mean, where there is, but the, the, you know, the particular decision rule, often whether you use regret or a, um, uh, an absolute standard is very contextual. I mean, so for instance, the, uh, the EPA example I gave you, the water quality example, do doesn't use regret. It uses an absolute performance, which is the, the regulatory standard, because um, the decision makers you know, are, they, they see their problem as meeting a, a particular standard. Now, you might eventually get to regret if you started to think that it was too expensive to get to the standard and you wanted to go back and say change the regulations. But, and so you might think differently in that problem, but at least in the problem as we set it up and as they were thinking about it, it's, it's an absolute versus regret. Other problems like the, um, uh, the, the energy one I showed you, regret was the, 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 the reasonable framing. So, so one thing is that we don't come in, I mean that's part of I think you know, the, the send multiple worldview parts is um, in more economic language is we're not specifying a social welfare function. We're laying out where um, you know, different decision rules and different social welfare functions give you similar or different answers. And there's where satisficing is again important because they're never going to be precisely the same in a complicated problem. But what region are you know, what region does it make a difference on the social welfare function you use, for instance, and what and where are we going to get pretty much the same answer? So it's, um, you know, it, it's, it, it, it very much, you know, uses, you know, economic constructs. And you can, we've got some examples where we go through very explicitly and say, here's, here's what you would do with the cost, you know, benefit cost uh, sort of framing of the problem or a social welfare function framing of the problem. And here's where you get consistent answers you know, in that framing, and here are situations where you might, so where, for instance, I mean, there's some great work the, the, by the, the guy who did that, uh, uh, the, the, the multi-objective robust uh, uh, optimizer, where they take the uh, Bill Nordhaus dice model, and, which is uh, sort of a, you know, very commonly used um, integrated assessment model, and they do a massive global uncertainty analysis on it. And, but with a whole series of Matt Adler's different social welfare hierarchy, um, oh, I'm forgetting the name right now, but his um, uh, social welfare functions put different weightings on poor and rich people and a whole bunch of different flavors of that. And it turns out that the, the biggest uncertainty in the Nordhaus dice model is not the technological or the climate uncertainty, it's a choice of social welfare function. And so if you just start with the standard um, utilitarian function, you've basically totally constrained the space of the model. And so that's just sort of, you know, lots, it, that's economics, but saying we don't have a single social welfare function, we're gonna look at a set of social welfare functions and use tools like this to see where it makes a difference. And there it makes a huge difference. Thank you, Daniel Andler. Um, uh, it seems to me <clears throat> uh, policymakers and politicians have a meta decision problem to solve, which mm -hmm. is to entrust you, Rand Corporation, with uh, dealing with their, showing them how to, make the decision or use traditional methods or maybe use another consultant. So how do they solve this <laughs> meta decision problem? Yeah, that's actually, yeah, yeah. Um, so let me take it out of the specific RAND context, but yeah. Um, uh, um, but the, um, you know, then here we get to, I mean, there's, uh, you know, there's normative and descriptive here as well. And so, um, uh, you know, so, I'm, I'm, so we can discuss the claim that, that using analytics in this way is, is, is a better way. And so, um, um, and then there's uh, how do you get people to use it? And so let me focus on that because I think that's, that's really interesting. Um, and so, I mean, certainly um, a lot of times decision makers want, uh, group like RAND to come in and just give them an answer, because that gives them, gives them cover. Um, and so giving them back trade-offs is not always the best, you know, what they want, you know, because, you know, Kahneman told us that, right? People avoid trade-offs, but we kind of, we, we know that from a number of ways. Um, but, um, and then often we, you get um, situations where, 
um, this sort of analytics is um, you know part of part of the debate or um, uh, part of a cultural shift, if you call it that. So a lot of the water agency, well, the, the EPA example I showed you, um, very smart guy that it was paid for by the federal government, but we did it for the city government. The guy that we worked with uh, was really interested because he wanted to understand the vulnerabilities of his strategy and what to do with it. But in the MOU we signed with him uh, for getting his data, we agreed not to publish any um, uh, pictures that focused on a time period earlier than 2050, because his plan only runs through 2035. And he didn't want to have a RAND report around that said his plan might be vulnerable within the time scale of his plan, because that would be too hard to explain to the city council. But it turns out that the climate models don't differentiate between the 24-hour variability in 2050 and 2035 very well. So look at 2050, it's not any different from an informational point of view than 2035, but it was, it was very different from him from a political point of view. And there is a real challenge in uh, the political discourse, at least in the places we live, with um, uh, the decision makers not getting certain projections. For instance, in a lot of these water agencies, um, the, the analysts understand the need to stress test their plans against a wide range of scenarios, but haven't quite figured out how to tell their elected boards or boards that are appointed by electeds to get them to think about multiple or publicly think about multiple scenarios when they've just voted rate increases on one. So um, there are um, you know, a lot of barriers to thinking that way, though in the, the TRIA, you know, the terrorism insurance example I showed you, um, we were hired by a, um, essentially an, a group of industries who wanted to insert that thinking in the debate because they thought it would make, it would help clarify the, you know, the political controversy, which it did seem to contribute to that. So um, the short answer to your question is yes, there's actually a lot of resistance to, you know, both organizationally and politically to thinking across multiple scenarios. And, but, um, uh, a lot of reasons to think that that would be a more constructive way to use analytics in our polit political debates, and a lot of reasons to think that the way we're currently using it is not very effective. So. Uh, Melody Lee, Imperial College. Uh, thank you. It's very interesting. Uh, do you have any thoughts about how you um, construct the, uh, um, the stakeholder group in the beginning, how you select the stakeholders, and does it depend on the uh, yeah. type of scenario? <laughs> yeah, yeah. All these, I think this is quite tricky uh, from, from my experience working with people developing technologies. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a great question, and that is one of the things that um, um, has been more ad hoc and simply done. So the ones where this has worked best um, have generally been um, stakeholder groups that are constructed by um, some sort of convening authority. So in the Colorado group I showed you, that was a big deliberative process. I did the, uh, the other sort of marquee one that I often talk about is the, um, the RAND's work with the Louisi state of Louisiana, master plan, where master plan on sustainable coast. And in both those instances, there was a strong convener. Uh, for the Colorado, it was the, um, the Bureau of Reclamation, which is part of the um, US Department of the Interior, which is a co-equal with the, the states in managing the, um, the river, but under emergency conditions, um, emergency powers delegate to the federal government. So the, when, when the Secretary of the Interior then asks you to sh send your best people to show up for a series of meetings for two years, um, you know, you, you basically need to come because the Secretary of the Interior would have emergency powers if things go wrong and if you weren't at the meetings, you know. So, and then with the state of Louisiana, uh, after Katrina, the state, you know, quite deliberately, you know, understood that it was too fractionated and set up a single state convener, a particular agency was supposed to bring people together to discuss. And there was a big flow of federal and money from the British Petroleum, you know, oil spill settlement that flowed through that agency. So again, they, they convened. So, um, and then often we do it locally when an agency has a, as a, is needs to, legally needs to come up with a water plan, um, which is a plan for how, you know, they'll provide water for the community for, 
the next 20 or 30 years, there's a legal requirement to file that with the state and they can't issue things like development permits unless they have the plan and so that's a natural platform to come together. Um, and then the, the tree example was a, you know, an ongoing discussion in Congress and so that was basically an external thing that then you could use to uh, facilitate um, sort of a sequential deliberation by going around talking to the, the various congressional staffs. So. Um, the last slide I put up, you know, with thinking about the social choice and the you know, pragmatist theory of learning is, is, is trying to get at what do you do when there's a weaker convener um, where someone who, oh, and then each of those, when you have a strong convener, they basically are the um, uh, responsible for saying who ought to be, you know, come to the table. Um, so, so you can then ask questions, are there people who are excluded? Are there voices that you aren't heard? And so that kind of understand how to do that analysis. And we've done some of that in Louisiana and the answer turned out to actually be they did a pretty good job of getting most voices. Uh, you know, if you go out and interview people purposely looking for uh, additional voices, you still get pretty much the same set of objectives that they, they look for in the, 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 that master plan. Um, so we can think about who, there's four ways to think about who's not at the table and we can do that. And that's sort of this cultural theory of risk thing. But how to operate without a strong convener is, I think, an open question and something I'm really interested in, in thinking about. I'd like to build on the general theme, uh, Catherine Mock, Stanford, <laughs> um, like to build on the general theme of when you think RDM is the right way to go and yeah. kind of taking that map of the world where you have all these different cases where yeah. RDM has been applied. Are there cases where you would say they want RAND analytics and in this case we're going to pair RDM with something else or are there cases where RAND analytics was requested and you said actually we'd like to go with something else entirely? Yeah. Um, yeah, I've got a, a picture I show um, which is, um, you know, where to use RDM and not, um, which has three <coughs> axes. And so one is, you know, how deep is the uncertainty? And then the other is how rich is the option space? And so, you know, if, if the uncertainty is well characterized, you don't go through this trouble. Um, and the deeper the uncertainty, you know, the more valuable this can be. Um, then if the option space is really narrow, um, if it's just like a pricing decision or something, you know, you, um, and you set one price, um, you know, you, you should take your best Bayesian guess and go with that because you can't make a single, you know, if it's, you can't make a, you know, if it's a yes or no or a single number, it's hard to make that robust. Um, um, and if the option space is richer, there's lots of different options. You can um, uh, hedge over time. You can, um, uh, you know, the RDM is more useful. You know, Charles, you went to a lot of trouble in your very first case to make it, you know, to make the option space as limited as possible, right? You know, and so um, this, this sort of stuff would not be useful at all in the case where, you know, you've no learning A or B, but we know it's A, you know, that, that this is wild overkill for that. Um, so about the richer the open space. And then the third axis is um, um, uh, called complexity, but that's essentially a heuristic for how much you're likely to, um, you know, learn from running the model as opposed to just having some expert, you know, expert intuition. And how do you distinguish that from your using um, it, it has to do with, um, um, it, it's different, it, it basically has to do with, um, uh, you know, how many causal steps can people think in their head? Or are, are uh, it's, it's how likely are um, um, you to discover scenarios, you know, when you do the scenario discovery that um, are non-obvious or that you would have trouble justifying, um, you know, without, without the models. I mean, if it's pretty obvious what the scenarios are and there's no controversy and then then, then you can just, you know, you, experts can just choose the scenarios. And if it's obvious what the hedging options are um, without running the models, then, um, then again, the RDM is, is, is overkill. So you know, if you can intuit, you know, what scenarios you ought to use and what the, the hedging options are, then it may be over, overkill. So those are the three formal axes. And then um, it, um, you know, this is less expensive when a model exists than if you have to build it. Um, and so we're doing a lot of work now trying to, can you come up with simple models or elicit simple models for pieces of the problem? But, you know, I mean, it gets more expensive the, the, the more there's, a you know, you need a model. 
and um, then it um, then the sort of the, the, the sort of the institutional cultural things you mentioned. I was, you, you mean, what's your name? Daniel. Daniel. Yeah, did Daniel mention? Yeah, I mean. Uh, one of the reasons we do a lot of work in water and then private sector, we've done some work with you know, automobile uh, and energies and things like that, is those tend to be analytic cultures. And so if you come in with no numbers or you know, no model, then you, you need some sort of model to, to, to argue and a quantitative argument. Whereas some cultures, you know, it's, it's, um, uh, uh, it, it's much more um, uh, you know, verbal argument based and so, it, it's harder to come in with a, uh, you know, this sort of analytics. I mean, it's, for a, it's, it's more of an impedance match. My name is Yaakov Ben Chaim from Technion. Um, I have a general question. I, I'd like to go back to Richard's question, comment about satisfice or optimize yeah. and um, say yes. Um, <laughs> yeah. And the question is, um, uh, what, what should you optimize and what should you satisfy? And I think that the distinction here is between procedural and substantive entities. I think that um, in deep uncertainty, um, one cannot optimize a substantive good, but you should optimize the procedure. So mm -hmm. that RDM or InfoGap uh, purport to optimize a procedure, mm -hmm. but not an outcome. Yeah. And uh, whether you satisfy the substantive good or maybe do something else, like maybe um, <coughs> um, seek to facilitate a yeah. wonderful outcome um, <coughs> to windfall an outcome is yeah. a different uh, approach. Yeah. But the distinction between satisfy and optimize is the distinction between substantive and uh, procedural goods. Yeah. 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 No, I think that's oh. a really, yeah. I'm Klaus Nearing, UC Davis. Mm -hmm. I would uh, like to pursue a little bit of um, many interesting aspects. Mm -hmm. One particular interesting thing was uh, in the context of climate change, the DICE model. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that the largest uncertainty was the uncertainty about uh, the social welfare function. Yeah. Now here, uh, I mean, many questions, but two questions in particular, how would you as a, as a kind of analyst or mm -hmm. consultant, would you treat them differently? How would you treat this large uncertainty about the social welfare function? Number one, and number two is how would the stakeholders, respondents, and so on respond to explicit representations of such uncertainty and disagreement? Mm -hmm. My impression is, in general, many audiences would not want to put those disagreements on the table. Mm -hmm. We would rather try to con just assume one particular welfare function without much discussion about it. <laughs> yeah, so um, <laughs> that goes back, you know, it's this other question. Yeah, I mean, um, and uh, I mean, I think sometimes um, in, in, in some deliberative process, some negotiated processes, it may be useful to not make some, some, some disagreements explicit. And um, that, you know, leaving them ambiguous may, may be a useful thing to do. And so, you know, in those cases, um, pointing out that the biggest uncertainty um, is, um, I, I, putting air quotes because it's, it's an uncertainty in a different sense than, say, the uncertainty about what future decarbonization pathways are. Um, but um, the, um, you know, in, in some cases, it may be useful to, to keep that, uh, you know, un, unstated. And so if that's, you know, that's the case you, or let me put, it, it may be useful to sequence that into a discussion at the appropriate time and that, um, you know, as Yaakov says, I mean, this, a lot of this is thinking about what is the appropriate process for bringing information into these discussions. And um, I think this is a key, key point about what I said earlier that um, I think the analytics is how to do it and what you're doing is, is well understood. But the, um, at this point, at least when we do this, 
um, questions like when is it appropriate to you know, open up this, this whole space of questions and when do we keep it quiet is much more ad hoc and done as a um, basically totally out of intuition and judgment based largely on the, uh, the convener. You know, so we, we as analysts talk to the convener and the parties, you know, would it be useful to raise this at this point or should we not raise it? But that, that's a kind of client-oriented yeah. uh, answer from a more principle-oriented. Well, I, I, my, my guess is, and that's why I showed this you know, second to last slide, you know, my, my guess is if you thought about this, um, that there's a lot various you know, social science disciplines would have to say about the question of, of under what circumstances and when do you bring that information usefully into a process or not. And so that it wouldn't have to be so client oriented ad hoc. And it's the same way, you know, we've got now vast, you know, capabilities to draw multi-objective, multi-scenario Pareto surfaces, um, but are kind of guessing or taking people's intuitive judgments on when that information, you know, when different corners of the space usefully go into the process um, is more the based on, you know, essentially the the political intuitive judgments of the, you know, the experts. Um, I suspect there's a lot to say about when, you know, that could help structure that process that at least I, you know, I don't have access to in any easy way in the literature and would be, I think, a really interesting set of questions, um, you know, to help one optimize the process and understand what sort of processes do you make that clear at the beginning? What co point do you bring it in at certain points? What point is it never useful? That, that's John Dewey, right? Who yeah, that's Dewey. Oh, that's Sen and that's Mary Douglas. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, Mary Douglas and cultural theory and Sen on, uh, on um, the social choice that I laid out on the slide earlier. I'm sorry, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Mark Lobet from Princeton. Yeah. I was intrigued by the idea that we should optimize uh, the selection of the, uh, the process itself yeah. <laughs> because it seems quite complicated and even harder than the substantive issue. And so I was thinking of a particular <laughs> complication, which is that you might have different groups to work with. So yeah. especially uh, there are these citizen juries and you have expert panels. Yeah. I was thinking that perhaps you would need different processes for these different groups because they are able to process information in different ways. They might have disagreements about the objectives, which are yeah. uh, somewhat different and so on. Yeah, uh, so uh, yeah, optimize the process was, was Yako's word. And so I, <laughs> I, I chose not to jump on that because I, I, I took his uber point, but not, uh, I, yeah, I, I don't think you're going to optimize the process anymore. I think you're going to satisfy the process as well. But I think, I think the, the important thing that, that Yaakov raised was um, that, um, um, you know, it's this decision. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we, yeah, we can do that later. But um, um, yeah, is, is that, um, is, is thinking about, you know, how, how the analytics affect a process of social choice and paying a lot of attention to the process in addition to just the analytics.